Hey, I just want to just stop real quick and just say welcome to the people who are watching live streaming. Uh, I was looking just between services. A bunch of people jumped on on uh, 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 Facebook, and we're watching the first service. And I want to say welcome to those people that are watching on Facebook as well and, and uh, uh, iPod podcast and all the people in the third space. But I want to just take a moment, and I want to uh, recognize a couple that have been married for 60 years. Dan and J.W. Murr, 60 years. Would you guys stand up and let us greet you just real quick? Thank you so much, guys. What a great... That's awesome. Thank you so much. You set the, uh, the pace for us, and we love that. So uh, everybody, we expect 60 years from you from that, right? <laughs> love Dan and JW. Hey, growing up, anybody else have a, a, a chore list that you had to do, and you had a list of chores you did every week? Anybody just raise your hand you had chores? Yeah, that's pretty much all of us. I had chores growing up, and I, I divided my chores into two lists, two groups. The first group was the chores that I hated. Anybody have chores you hate? <laughs> And then I had the second group of chores, and those are the ones that proved my parents hated me. Anybody have? (laughs) So in the first group, I had, here's the ones I hated. It was like clean my room, make my bed. I I don't understand why you had to make your bed if you're going to get back in it the next night, right? Anybody with me on this? And then uh, take the trash out, those types of things. And the chores that I just, I felt proved that my parents hated me was mow the yard. Anybody, we don't do that here, but anybody in a place where you had to mow the yard every week? Oh, my lands. It was like, it never stopped growing. It was terrible. And then I had to clean out the garage and take a bath. Those are the things that I thought, (laughs) those are the worst right there. But I think the chore that bothered me the most, and I don't think there's even a close second to this. The chore that I hated the most, I grew up in the Midwest in Kansas City, was pulling weeds. (laughs) Hated that. And in, in Kansas City, we had these weeds, dandelions. Anybody have dandelions you had to pull up? Dandelions are the worst because they, I, I, I think they fall, they're not going to be the dandelions in heaven because I really believe that dandelions that are the satanic type of weeds, they have roots that go all the way to the depths of hell. I proved it one time, I pulled one out, and I'm telling you, it's like you've got to dig a moat around it in order to get that, the roots of it out. Because if you, and here's the thing about dandelions, if you don't get the roots to that dandelion, it's growing back the next day. And I remember one time my friends were uh, riding their bikes around the neighborhood, and I'm, I'm in the front yard. I'm, I'm pulling up these weeds, and they're mocking me as they're riding around, saying, hey, we're going to play. Come on, let's go. And so I wanted to hurry up and get the weed, but there's a ton of weeds, dandelions out there, and I'm pretty good at soccer. And so all of a sudden I came up with this brilliant idea. I thought, you know, I'm going to kick all the heads off of the dandelion. So I went around, just kick, 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 kick. And when I stood back, I went, wow, this is fabulous. You can't tell if there's any weeds or not. And when God my parents said, hey, it's all weeded, we're all good. And they said, wow, that's impressive, Craig, great job. It's a win-win. I got to go play. My parents were happy until the next day, and all of a sudden, all those weeds are right back up. And I learned a lesson that there's power in the roots. Roots are, are everything. That, that, that's really what we're talking about in this series, that there's power in, in, in the roots. Specifically, there's power in the roots of our faith. This is really important. I, if, if you think about roots and, and, and the fact that roots provide nourishment, they provide strength, they provide stability and health, and, and it's not just in, in, in weeds or it's not just in trees, but roots are important to our spiritual lives. Roots are essential for our spiritual growth. And the Apostle Paul had a great comment about our spiritual roots. He says this in Colossians chapter 2, verse 7. It's coming up on the screen. He says, let your roots grow down into him and draw up nourishment from him so you will grow in faith, strong and vigorous. I love those words, strong and vigorous in the the truth that you were taught. Let your lives overflow with thanksgiving for all that he has done. Listen to me. I I want you to hear this before we go any further. I want that for you. I want you to have this this truth and this this root system in your faith that you will be strong. Last Sunday, we talked about the Apostles' Creed and incredible theology in the Apostles' Creed. Today, I want to take a look at the Nicene Creed and the incredible theological truths that are from the Bible that are right there. But before we get into the Nicene Creed, I need to address one issue that I I should have addressed last week, and I jumped over, and I said, you know what, we're all right, we don't have to talk about that, 
and uh, got in a little bit of a hurry and uh, paid a price for it because this last week I got more notes, positive, not negative, positive notes from people saying, Pastor, I didn't understand that. That didn't make sense to me. In fact, I had somebody in my small group said, when we got to this part of the Apostles' Creed, they wouldn't even say it because it bothered them so much. And it's this idea that uh, we need to talk about the difference between uh, little C Catholic and big C Catholic. Some of you go, oh, yeah, I had that question too. How many of you grew up, amazed me in the first service, how many of you grew up with a Catholic tradition? You went to a Catholic church growing up. Would you raise your hand? Look at that. That's a lot of people. That's awesome. And I just want to say this. I'm so glad you're here at our church. And I, I say this with all honesty, that you bring a rich heritage of, of this unbelievable respect for God uh, uh, from, the, from the heritage you grew up in. You bring that to us. I, I think one of the strengths of our church is we have about 10 or 15% of people that grew up in a Nazarene denomination. And, and we have this whole bunch of uh, other people that grew up in a different denomination, and you bring your strengths from your denomination, and it makes us stronger. I believe that, don't you? And so that's what it gets really into it when I say little c Catholic. Catholic simply means universal. It means one. It means that we're united. We're together. There's a difference between little c Catholic and big c Catholic. Little c Catholic simply means uh, universal. That we're united. It means that we believe in the, in the universal church of Jesus Christ. That there are Christians in every denomination, Christian denomination. If you believe that there are Christians in other churches, then you are a little C Catholic. I'm a little C Catholic. And, 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 and I, I love that. That, they're, they're, that. that Listen, the other denominations are not our competition. They are our brothers and sisters in Christ. That's the truth. Amen. I'm not a big C Catholic, Roman Catholic denomination, but I'm a little C Catholic because it means I believe that there are believers in other Christian churches. And I hope that makes sense to you. When we get to heaven, I promise you this, that if you're starting to look around for your, uh, your Nazarene corner of heaven, there's not going to be one. <laughs> We're all going to be in heaven as followers of Jesus Christ. And that's the truth. So that's what the little C Catholic, and we're going to read it here when we read the Nicene Creed, when it gets to that part. Uh, uh, I believe in the Catholic and Apostolic Church. That when, when you say that, you believe that there are other Christians in other denominations, and we believe that. But today I want to look very, uh, we want to look at a famous root system of our faith called the Nicene Creed. And here's the historical context. The Nicene Creed was, was written in response to a heresy or people that were, were arguing about, uh, in the early church, uh, a heresy swirling around this issue right here. Different than last week in the Apostles' Creed. This creed addresses the fact that Jesus truly is God. Now, the reason you say, well, why is that important? The reason it's important is that if Jesus was not God, then he, he could not have been perfect. And if he's not perfect, then he could not have paid for our sins. And if Jesus was not God, then he didn't rise from the dead. And if he didn't rise from the dead, then our faith is absolutely pointless. Everything, and I promise you this, everything in our faith hinges on the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the fact that Jesus is God. And everybody said... That's, that's unbelievably true. And uh, 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 anyways, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says it like this. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is our faith. So here's the result of the, the Council of Nicaea met in uh, the year 325 A.D., it's how, uh, how we got the Nicene Creed. And the Nicene Creed, what I love about it, it is so clear and so basic. And when I read it, I want to tell you, there's just something in me that goes, yes, that's the truth. And it serves the whole Christian world as a summary of what believers in Jesus Christ really believe. Last week, we read together the Apostles' Creed. Today, I want us to read together, all of us, out loud, I want to read the Nicene Creed. And it's rather long, but I want us to read every part of it together. So here we go. It's coming up on the screen. It's also in your notes. And I want you to read along right out loud. Let's say it together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, 
eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from life, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Wow, come on, isn't that good? I think that is fabulous. I, I just get so pumped when I read it. And I just thought, okay, you know, when, when I started looking at it and, and I said, okay, now I want to speak on that. How am, I gonna, how am I gonna teach on this? I thought, I only have a couple hours to teach on this, right? <laughs> so in the next 20 minutes, I thought, I got three words that I wanna. When you think of the Nicene Creed, I want you to remember these three words. So here's the three words. It's big, do you see this in your notes? Big, deep, and wide. Big, deep. And, and, and so the, the first word, the big word big, if you'll write this right beside it, I want you to write beside it the word we, W E. It's the first two words we believe in the Nicene Creed, in, in, in the first, two, uh, first phrase, it's we believe. Now, the church fathers were making a strong statement. You've got to know that this is a big thing. They were not simply writing on behalf of, hey, here's what we individually believe to be true. They were speaking on behalf of all those who call themselves followers of Jesus Christ. It is a bold statement. But it had to be a bold statement in order to strike at the heart of what they were going after. Their theology was under attack. People were questioning something that was one of the key tenets of the faith. And so by writing, we believe, they were saying, hey, we stand together in this. We are, it's like we are linking arms. We are, we are stacking hands. You know what? The first of a baseball game, we're stacking hands. We're doing the Macarena. I just wanted to see if you were awake. I thought maybe I might have some people asleep by then. Come on, we're in this together. We're, well, what they were saying, it's not about me. This is what we believe. And that we believe is a big deal. You say, well, how big is it? It's billions big. Billions of people before us, billions of believers in Jesus Christ now here on this earth. That's how big it is. Billions represent a legacy of men and women of faith who have come before us, are linked together with us in what we believe. Here's why this is such a big deal today. My faith is connected to your faith, and your faith is connected to our faith. That's how it works. That's the we. And the Bible says it like this, Romans chapter 12, verse 5. So in Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the other members. Your faith is like one link in this long, powerful chain of believers that the Bible refers to as the body of Jesus Christ. Your one link and my one link, though, are totally ineffective. And I say that, and I realize there's a lot of power behind that. My link and your one link is, is, is ineffective if they're not connected to other people. Being a follower of Jesus Christ is not about I, it's about we. We is a word that unifies us together. I is a word that isolates and creates individualism. I know our culture loves I, loves individualism, but individualism leads to selfishness. Don't get me wrong on this. Now, I want to make sure theologically you know where I stand. Being a follower of Jesus Christ is a personal decision that each one of us has to make. Amen? Amen. So please don't hear me saying that, well, everybody's, that's not what I'm saying. It's very personal to me as an individual. I have to make that decision that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. However, 
I'm not, I'm not in now, I'm a believer of Jesus Christ. I'm not in isolation of other people. So when I hear people look at me and they say, hey, Craig, you know, my faith is a very private thing to me. I, I, I want to look at them and I want to go, how sad is that? You don't really understand what the body of Christ is really all about. You are to live out your faith in the context of we. And when you grasp that point, it'll change how you live your life. Let me make this really practical. In your notes... I put big, deep, and wide. And then at the end, I put big, deep, and wide again. They say, well, why did you do that twice? Because at the end, I want you to have action steps. And so where it says big at the end of your notes, I want you to write this in because this is the action step that I want you to take this week. Here's the action step. You see that at the end where it says big? I want you to write beside the second big. I want you to write the word get connected. I want you to get connected with other followers of Jesus Christ. Some of us came here, uh, come here week after week, and you barely talk. You come in, you, you sit down, and uh, you try to find a seat. That's a little difficult. And then you, uh, you, you get up and leave. You never talk to anybody. You don't know the people around you. And I realize that OVCN is a big family. I know it's tough with, with it, being in a big family. But if you came from a big family where you had big family reunions... There would be times at big family reunions where you would sit next to some family. Maybe you, 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 you didn't know them, but for sure you would, even if you didn't know them, didn't know anything about them, their family, you talk to them, right? And even if it was that goofy uncle, you'd still talk to that goofy uncle, right? Man, I want to tell you, I, my, my, my family will tell you this is absolutely true. I have worked very hard to be, everybody has a goofy uncle, I'm the goofy uncle, can you, can, you, can you handle that? Is that all right? But you, you would talk to that person. And that's why I'm, as, I'm asking you to do that here in our church. That when you come on Sundays or if you come during, when you get connected and, and, and celebrate the fact that that person that you're sitting next to, that is in front of you, behind you, beside you, wherever, that when you're walking out there beside, wherever it is, they are part of the we that you celebrate as believers in Jesus Christ. I, I want to challenge you to get excited when you meet other people in, in the faith, and, and maybe it's at work, or maybe it's uh, you, you're walking somewhere, and somebody says, hey, I see that shirt, and Jesus won, and, and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, and you say, yeah, what, what's your story? And, and they share their story. and you, you're, Listen, they could be from a different denomination, but if they're a follower of Jesus Christ, you celebrate the fact that they're part of the we. Amen? We, we take time in our services to stand up and greet each other. And please don't come in here and go, there we go again. We got to do that. No, don't have that attitude. It is a privilege. <laughs> that was a nervous laugh, wasn't it? <laughs> Some people are going, yeah, I did that. Did you hear me? I didn't know you heard me, Craig. <laughs> it is a privilege to share in our faith of Jesus Christ. Amen. Because we're part of a we. We have a lot of babies in our church. It's something that I'm so unbelievably proud of, that we have young couples and and, uh, babies are being born all the time. It's amazing to me as I watch these young couples have their first kids. It's, it's so cool. And many of them are in small groups. And if they're in a small group, it's so wonderful to see the small groups minister to them and, and be like community is supposed to be. And, and uh, they don't have to worry about meals for a week or two because their small group is bringing them in and cooking meals and making sure they're all right and answering questions. And, and a lot of times, uh, these young families will have uh, a diaper for their first baby. They'll have diaper party parties. And, and uh, I, I, yeah, you laugh. I've never actually gone to a diaper party. I've been asked several times. I've never gone to one. And the reason, you say, well, why haven't you gone to one? It's because I never know if I'm supposed to bring diapers or wear diapers. You know, they don't make that plain. And I guess it just, I guess it depends, right? (laughs) You had about the same reaction as the first service. That's unusual. Wow. But I look at our young families, and they're, they're doing life together. And, and I go, that's the we in church. Come on, that's how it's supposed to be. Amen? Amen. So the big idea in the Nicene Creed is we believe. And the action step that I want you to take in this first point is get connected. Now to the next word. It's the word deep. Next to the word deep, I want you to write this word. Write the word three. 
What's deep about the Nicene Creed? You go back and you look at it and you read it and study it. It's, it, it. What's deep about it is that it's an explanation that God is three persons. That's what they're going after in this creed, that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three persons, one being. And the Nicene Creed uses precise language, and it's so clear that Jesus and the Holy Spirit were not created. You read and go back and see. Jesus and the Holy Spirit were not created by God, that they were there from eternity, and there's three persons with the same essence, one being. This is unbelievably deep. Think about this. Jesus, and, and we spent a lot of time last week in the Apostles' Creed talking about it because this is what the Apostles' Creed gets after, that Jesus is God in the flesh, that when, when he came to earth, he was 100% God, and at the same time, make sure your theology's right, he's 100% human. 100% God, it's not a 50-50, it's 100% and 100%. Remember, the, if you were here last week, I made a comment about Wolverine. Remember that one? And I said, that's not the way it is. He's 100%, 100%. And then God, that God became man in Jesus, that's called the incarnation. And if you ever hear that word, that's what it means. Incarnation means God became human in Jesus. That God became one of us in order to save us. John chapter 1. Great theology here. John writes, but although the world, the world was made through him, the world didn't recognize him when he came. And then it says this next line. It says, so the word. And you go, well, what's the word? The word there, John's favorite phrase for Jesus is the word. That's what, in the gospel of John, that's what John calls Jesus. So the word, Jesus, became human and lived here on earth among us. And the first part of verse 10, it says, the world was made through him. Jesus was there from the very beginning. He's not a created being of God. Jesus is God. In John 14, Jesus is speaking, and he's actually referring to the triune God. And he talks about himself, he talks about God the Father, and he talks about God the Holy Spirit. Watch this, John 14, starting with verse 16. And I, Jesus is speaking, and I will ask the Father, God the Father, and he will give another counselor, talking about the Holy Spirit, who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. And the world at large cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But Jesus says, but you do because he lives with you now and later he will live in you. Amen. Man, that's fabulous. Trying to understand this and get your mind around the, the, the Trinity, the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It's kind of like a newborn trying to understand quantum physics. It's a little bit difficult. It's like me trying to figure out why so many people, on, like on TV, so you think he can dance. I, I don't get it. The Trinity is difficult for us to understand. I, I get that. Greatest theologians ever have discussed this, pondered this, argued over this for centuries. And there's this famous quote by a famous theologian that says, to fail to believe in the Trinity, you'll lose your soul. To try to understand the Trinity, you will lose your mind. <laughs> so I'm sitting there in class in graduate school, and I'm listening to my theology professor talk about the Trinity and explain it. And I remember the professor uh, as he's teaching, I'm taking notes, and I guess, I, I guess as I was taking notes, I was kind of nodding a little bit and in agreement, because, because at one point, the professor, theology professor, looks at me, and he says, Mr. Coulter, you look like you understand this. <laughs> I just smiled, and I said, no, I don't. I want to, but could you go over one more time? And so he goes over it again, and, and as he's going over it, I go, oh, oh, yeah. And, and, and he gets to the end, he goes, well, do you understand it now? I said, no, I've got no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> it is so deep to think that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, who lives in me, simultaneously, he can be one without losing the essence of the other. <laughs> to try to communicate that, I actually thought, okay, I'm going to go to my notes here, and I'm just going to read it straight from my notes and see if this will help you. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all one God. Amen. The same in essence, equal in power, equal in glory. Yet they are each distinct 
in persons, one God, three persons, who are inseparable yet distinct. Well, I think that pretty much clears it up. Let's go home now, right? I'll close in prayer. Uh, honestly, I, I, I'm okay with not understanding everything about God. If I could fully understand everything about God, then he would be too small of a God for me to teach about. And there would be no need for us to have any faith. I barely understand. Listen to me. I want to make sure you know this. I, I'm a pretty simple person. I barely know how my Bluetooth hands-free works in my car. And still, I depend on that thing. And I'm okay with taking some things and going, you know what? I don't know how it all works, but I'm going to trust that it works. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't try to intellectually understand and learn theology. I think that ought to be part. Theology is just how we think about God, and we ought to work on that. But when it comes to the Trinity, you may have heard illustrations before. You may have heard pastors that said things like this, and I, I, I love these things. These are really good illustrations. I heard one pastor that said the Trinity is kind of like ice and steam and water, three distinct forms, one essence. That's pretty good. I heard somebody else say it's kind of like a three-leaf shamrock, you know, three distinct leaves, one essence. But the one that, the illustration that was most helpful for me was when somebody got up, a preacher got up, and I think this is so powerful, what a great illustration this is, and he said, the Trinity for me, and this helped me a lot, the Trinity is more like Neapolitan ice cream. <laughs> Come on, anybody loving this? Three distinct flavors, one essence. Okay, I thought that was pretty good. Some of you, <laughs> I know, I lost some of you right there. Some of you are looking at me going, okay, you know what, Craig, to be honest, it is a little bit complicated, and it's probably not worth uh, caring about. It's probably just no big, you couldn't be further from the truth. It is worth caring about because if Jesus was not fully God, then he would not have the capacity to save you and to save me from our sins. This is a big deal. God came to earth as Jesus to do for us what you and I could not do for ourselves. Amen? So the reason this is so important is because the truth of the Trinity means that you and I are never outside of God's presence. This is big, listen. We're never outside of God's presence. So when I accept what God, the God-man Jesus did for me, dying for my sins on the cross, and I pray to God the Father for forgiveness of my sins, and he sends the Holy Spirit to invade and to live in my life, I'm never outside of God's presence. Man, that's powerful to me. And the Bible says it like this, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you, circle that in you, and was given to you by God? Those are, those are key theological words because the Trinity is true. You are never far away from God. And here's what we do. A lot of times in our minds we go, well, you know, God the Father, he's kind of a distant deity. And Jesus is, you know, he lived 2,000 years ago. And, and Craig, I, I can't even begin to think about, you know, uh, the Holy Spirit kind of sounds a little like Casper the ghost and floats around. So, so. So what happens if you have that kind of a thinking that when you, then all of a sudden you begin to treat God like he's a distant God. And we pray to this, this distant God and we live our lives as if God is distant and he doesn't care about us. No, 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 no. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says that he, God, is right here. That he's living in you and with you. Amen. Come on, here's the action I want you to take this next week. I want you to get this. So here's the action step. For the word deep, remember there's, there's two parts of deep. There's deep in the notes, and then at the end of the notes, there's, there's the three words again. So in the, in the second part where it says deep, I want you to write this in. Action step for, for the word deep is recognize God's presence in your life. This will change how you live. Recognize God's presence that God is always with you because God is living in you. That should change everything. See, if I recognize that God is always with me because his spirit is in me, then it's gonna change the conversations that I have and it's gonna change what I talk about. It's gonna change what I view. It's gonna change how I treat people. It's gonna change when I get in my car and I leave this parking lot and there's all kinds, of, there's a car that, that cuts me off. Amen? Listen, God's spirit is living in me. 
And it makes a difference how I treat people. It, it makes a difference in my integrity and how I live that integrity out. And it makes a difference how I deal with temptation. A lot of times, what we'll do is we'll, we'll give in to temptation and we just throw up our hands and we go, God, forgive me. There we go. I, I, I did it again. And it's because we think of God as some distant deity. No, he's not distant. You got to recognize that he is with you. And, and God's spirit is, is living in you. The tr- the, that truth alone changes everything. Everything. And there's the third word. It's the word wide. Next to the word wide in your notes, would you write in this, his love for me? So here's the three words. Big, it's, it's the big idea is we believe. The deep part of the Nicene Creed is three. They're explaining the tr- trinity. And then wide is God's love for me. It's wide enough. Hear me today. God's love is so wide that I can never run from it. His love is wide enough to include everybody, even those people that came today, and you're not even sure why you're here. You're sitting here, you're going, what are we talking about? And is this really going to make a difference? And you really don't believe in God, but I promise you today that God's love is wide enough that even if you don't believe in God, God's love is for you. Wow. His love is wide enough to include everyone. Why did God come to earth as Jesus? Because God loves people who sin. It's an amazing thing, isn't it? That God would love, he doesn't love sin, but he loves sin. People who do sin. He loves sinners. And God didn't do all this for his own sake. He did this for our salvation so that we could connect, so that we could have a relationship with God. And we know John 3.16. We got that one down. But John 3.17 talks about, well, why did Jesus come to earth? And it explains it. John 3, verse 17, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, you and me, But he came into the world, you see that last two words, to save us. And I I realized that when we read the Nicene Creed, we read it kind of quick, and and I hope you go back and maybe look at it, reread it, maybe study it, but it said about halfway through, it said these words. It said, for us and for our salvation, Jesus came down. God became human. It screams out, hey, God loves you. And here's here's what it's all saying together. The Nicene Creed says the big idea, it's it's about we believe. And, And the deep part about it is it's all about God's presence in our life. And then the wide idea is that it's all about God's love for you and for me. And here's the equation I want you to write down. Somewhere in your notes, I want you to write this down because it's, it's so powerful. And I don't have time to explain it a lot. I'll just kind of give it to you and I'll, I'll need to move on. But it simply is this. The equation that God's love plus God's presence, God's love plus God's presence equals a full life. <laughs> a better life than we could ever possibly dream. So here's the action step right at the end where it says wide. Remember, we had these, these three words twice. We have big, deep, and wide in the notes. And then at the end, action steps, big, get connected, deep, recognize his presence. And then I really worked hard on this last one. Here's the action step for wide. I was, Thursday was my day off. And I thought, you know, it's, it's beautiful here. It was 70 degrees. If you're watching live streaming from Alaska or somewhere like that, and it's like below zero, just want you to know in Arizona, it's 70 this week. Isn't that good? We live a great life. So I go outside, and I'm uh, day off, I'm, I'm sun tanning, and I'm sitting there, and I'm going, this is the action step. <laughs> sun tan. <laughs> I, I at first had the word Basque, but I don't know how to spell Basque. Basque, does it have a Q, U, and an E at the end of it? I, I don't know. So I, I, I thought, oh, no, this is it. This is so much better. Sun tan in God's love. Everybody with me on this? Some of you going, I don't know what you mean. 
I want you during this next week, every day, I want you to spend a few minutes in your quiet time with God, and I want you to recognize that God loves you because he's in you, he's with you, his presence is there. But bask in how, how deep and how wide God's love is. And, 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 and you know, I, I think that is so powerful. I, I, I would love for you to walk out of here today and go, man, Craig, that is so deep. That is so, man, that is power. I don't know how you came up with that. You know what? I'll just tell you right now how I come up with that last point. I stole it from the Bible. <laughs> That's a good place to steal from, Right? Because Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3, here's what he says, and I close with this. Ephesians 3, it's at the end of your notes. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, and here it is, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep God's love really is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is so great you'll never fully understand it, and then you'll be filled with the fullness of life and the power, watch this, and you'll be filled with the power that comes. Where does our power come from? It comes from God. Wow. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Heavenly Father, I pray that this week, we would do these three actions. We would find every day to do these three things. That we would get connected with other believers. And even if they don't go to our church, we would just take the step of getting connected with other believers. And then two, we would recognize your presence in our lives, that you are living in us. And then number three, as goofy as it is, I pray every day this next week we would spend time sun tanning in your, we would let the radiance of your love fill our lives. And if, if, if we come and we're fearful and we're scared and we're, we're not sure and we have doubts, that we would just realize how much you love us. And we would understand, begin to understand just in part, the depth of your love and, and the, the, the wideness of your love. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us that much. In Jesus' name, I pray these things. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you.